So welcome, welcome to the gender and intersectionality session. Uh, the session is co-hosted by IID and Women Climate Centers International. But before we start, I want to hand over to Nora to take us through admin issues on uh, the tech side especially, and then we'll continue. So Nora Nisi, over to you. Thank you, Tracy. Um, as Tracy mentioned, I'm just going to go over a few housekeeping rules. It shouldn't take too long. Um, so I just want to let you know that this Zoom meeting is being recorded um, and we, make, we may make parts of it available on our website at a later date. We've also taken taking security precautions <clears throat> to discourage uninvited participants from joining the meeting. So if you could not uh, share the link on social media, that would be great. This is a place where people you can, um, take the link and, and uh, Zoom bomb the event. Um, and for the best meeting experience, we encourage that you close all non-essential applications on your device, um, such as Skype or Teams, um, so that it, they don't distract you. Um, many of you probably already know how to use Zoom, uh, but I'm just going to go through some of the functions. You will have a mute and unmute button. Um, if you click this, it'll mute you and unmute you. We encourage you to please only have your unmute off if you're actively speaking or um, at the event. Otherwise, please keep yourself muted as to avoid too much background noise. Uh, you can share your webcam video if you choose. Uh, we'd love to see everyone's faces. However, if you're experiencing connection problems, um, then you should try turning your video off as sometimes that helps. Uh, you can use the chat that you will find the chat link uh, just between participants and share screen where you can enter your comments and questions. If you have any technical issues with Zoom, my name is Nora, just send me a message um, and I will try to help you out as best as possible. Uh, and finally, you can do reactions. Uh, you can do the like and dislike icons as a quick reaction. Um, you can also update your name to let us know who you are and your organization. If you go to the participants uh, button below, select more and rename, then you can rename yourself. Uh, finally, a reminder that IID again is recording the meeting. Um, and if you have technical difficulties to please just message me directly via the chat box. And that is all and over to you, Tracy. Thank you very much, Nora. Uh, so welcome once again for those just joining us. Uh, gender and intersectionality, uh, some of the key things that we thought would look at today, they involve difficult conversation. And uh, in the previous CBS, gender has been a cross-cutting issue, trying to pick out how sessions are addressing gender. But in this CBA, we thought that we'd have a dedication session to look at gender equality and intersectionality, given the increasing global inequality. And our discussion today is focusing on all the CBA themes, trying to articulate the importance of adopting a gender and intersectional perspective to support uh, climate intergenerational justice. And this is linked to other adaptation agendas, the locally led adaptation principles, especially principle four, focuses on addressing structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, disabled, displaced indigenous people, and marginalized ethnic groups. So we, we are trying to plug in this session with other conversations going on. And also at the COP26, uh, linking with the Lima Work Program and the Gender Action Plan. So we think that this, this should be a start of the conversation to look at how do we consider differentiated characteristics, need priorities and of different groups so that adaptation policies and practice is fit for purpose and reduces inequality. So we hope that this conversation will continue in Slack even after this session. So in case you need to share ideas, connect, do go to Slack and share with us. But before we go to the panelists, we have a team of panelists speaking to each of the themes across CBA. 
how they interact with gender and intersectionality. Would love to hear from everybody on what you think about these questions before the panel comes in. So at this point, I want to hand over to Karen to take us through the Mentimeter where we can hear what your views are. Uh, this session is about inclusion, about hearing everybody's voice. So over to you, Karen. Thank you, Tracy, and welcome everyone. Um, as Tracy mentioned, we want this uh, session to be as interactive as possible and um, for you to share your perspectives on how aspects of gender and intersectionality links to the themes of CBA. Um, we have questions related to responsive policy, youth inclusion, innovation, nature-based solutions in food systems and climate finance. So please go to Mentimeter at um, menti.com and enter the code shown. Uh, could you uh, move to the next slide, Nora, please? Please introduce the, the code shown on the screen is 39861689. Or alternatively, you can just use the link um, that, uh, that we will share in the chat box. Um, and the first question is a nice breaker um, to um, uh, to know where are you connecting from. And after that, you will be able to answer the questions related um, to responsive policy. Um, the questions are, um, how are climate policies addressing gender, local needs and priorities? And we will give a little bit of time to um, share the, the responses. Responses are now flowing in. Um, we see people from South Africa, Ghana, Amsterdam, Nepal, Bangladesh. I, I love the, the work clouds. Um, it, it looks um, so, so global, the, the responses that, that, we, that we are collecting. Um, and the, the first question related to responsive policies, how are climate policies addressing gender, local needs and priorities? And we are seeing answers that it says policies putting the gender word just for the sake of it, not correctly taking actions on the ground. So it's a matter of implementation challenges by addressing particular needs of women, planning investment for gender disaggregated population, um, comment that it's still a, a long way to go. Um, people highlighting the relevance of the context, the policies, implementation challenges, and enforcement, uh, the role of NAPS in having the right policies addressing gender local needs, and the gap between having the plans and implementation. Um, so more reflects on the very patriarchal approach to climate solutions. A comment that says that um, there are no, don't see any climate policies addressing gender. And you will have the link as well to these responses afterwards if you, if you want to see what others have contributed. We won't go into a lot of detail in here, but we will have these, these responses as a, as a starting point for, for re reflection. The next question is about youth inclusion. And the question is, what are the gendered experiences of youth participation, engagement, and leadership in community-based adaptation? And there's a question here about the lack of recognition, female needs to be, needs of, um, female needs often overlooked, um, we we'll love to learn about this one. Sometimes there's more space among youth to promote gender equality and address inequalities depending on the context. Um, a comment that highlights that girls are traditionally excluded. We can see an increased gender awareness among young people. We need more female participation in youth, in youth, in, in, in youth groups. 
um, another highlight, the, the issue of the work burden of women that highlights the different roles that, that women have in, um, in society. And the next question is about innovation. The question is how can innovation address gender-based exclusion and facilitate effective engagement of women in community-based adaptation? Um, disaster risk management, someone that says that not, not sure, not sure. Innovative women-led initiatives should be given a chance and resources to be implemented. Mm -hmm. These solutions, um, not sure. Um, someone highlights the, the Pomoja Voices Toolkit that was developed uh, with partners in, with IID. Um, a great example of this, of how can, um, how can the voices of of, of women and youth can be for and center of the planning processes in, in developing priorities and identifying priorities for gender, um, for girls and um, women and youth. Lessen the workload for women by mobilizing women and reducing their work burden. Um, someone highlights something that Greta Thunberg has frequently highlighted that it's talk, 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 not necessarily innovation. Engage women and diverse groups and youth. Household dialogue to share roles and responsibility. This is a recognition of balancing the, um, some of the, of the roles that, that women um, have. The reproductive, the reproductive roles that is usually associated um, asymmetrically to women. Engage women and diverse groups with youth for monitoring and tracking results. And now we move to the nature-based solutions theme. And the question is, how can gender and intersectional local knowledge and, and action deliver more resilient local food systems and restore ecosystems? Um, someone ac uh, answers through inclusion, couple dialogue to divide the workload. This has highlighted, has been hi highlighted in the, in the previous slide as well. Um, the need to balance um, the different activities, the different reproductive and productive work. Providing equal opportunity and responsibility to all, again, highlights the need of um, providing equal opportunity and recognition to all. Um, someone, no idea, which is also a, a great um, answer. Uh, we will have breakout group discussions afterwards that will focus on what needs to be improved how can we address the, the gaps that highlight that are, that are highlighted in the different topics? Increase knowledge, skills of women and marginalized people. To listen, it needs to be a community driven for it to be sustainable. Um, understanding the deeply held gendered knowledge about natural resources management and food production. Equal rights. Someone highlight the, the important role of women in food production and water resources in the home. Mm -hmm. Giving them voice in community makes food systems more responsive and better managed. Mm -hmm. And the final topic that we will address is how is climate finance responsive to gender needs and priorities that enhance local adaptation? Um, someone highlights that we need to raise financial literacy among women. And remember that these questions are the same questions that will be answered by the panelists. And after that, we will break out in groups to discuss what, what actions need to be taken to improve the gaps that we collectively have identified in each of these, of these themes. Increase access to finance that helps to improve their own business. So it, it tackles, highlights the, the, the question of, um, and the need to have women at the forefront and the, the importance of self-organization 
and autonomy and agency to start own business and, and then having opportunities, enhanced opportunities to ac access climate finance. Often it's still only in small grants, it's time that we step up our game. We need to trust and decolonize development. And I will stop sharing my, my slide. Thank you everyone uh, for participating in this Mentimeter session. Um, we had, I think, a very good reflections, start warming up reflections that um, will help us through uh, the session, especially in the breakout groups. And with that, I hand over to Tracy, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you, Karen. And um, thanks everyone for your contribution and interventions there. Uh, so we now have a panel uh, with speakers that are going to speak to each of the themes. And uh, I will start with uh, Desmond Alugno. So Desmond is a coordinator for the Africa Member Support Program under the Global Alliance for Incinerate Alternatives. Uh, he works with the Gayo Ghana and he's a co-founder. He's a climate expert focusing on zero waste models and organizational management. But what is interesting is that he focuses a lot on building movements, provide youth and gender-based leadership. He supports frontline communities to adapt to climate change and is championing the call for eco-friendly menstrual pads and the abolition of government taxes on sanitary pads in Ghana as well as building capabilities of vulnerable groups and providing solutions on youth empowerment and public education. Uh, that's impressive for a young male working on issues that are affecting young women. And uh, so in the previous CBAs, especially CBA 14, we had uh, a, a theme on the youth, but most of the, or the key messaging around the youth inclusion was that policymakers need to seek uh, youth inclusion in climate policy and programming, and not to look at youth as just volunteers, but focus on models that can compensate them and motivate them to contribute, and also supporting their leadership capabilities to address the generational gap. But we also know that youth are not homogeneous. We have we, you, young men or girls, we have young women, and boys, we have those living in informal settlements. We have the unemployed, the disabled, those in developed countries and developing countries. So Desmond, what are your gendered and intersection experiences of youth participation, engagement and leadership in community-based adaptation, given that you're interacting at those levels? Thank, oh, thank you, yes. Tracy. Um, and first of all, I would like to appreciate the fact that we have this session uh, under CBA 14, um, offering young people the opportunity to also participate and listen, which is in line with this particular topic we are discussing today. Um, start with, uh, when I was told to talk on this topic, I started actually to talk with uh, some of the youth within the networks just to also understand their perspectives and then to share with the broader group that will be here so that it doesn't come only from me. And it was interesting that I speak, I spoke with a, um, young agriculturalists and landscapers in Nigeria, I spoke with um, uh, people working on biodiversity and community resilience in the Philippines. I spoke with other groups across Africa and also other places. And, what we can see is the fact that it's not homogeneous, like you said. It is a matter of how do we balance the aspirations of all these young people. The experiences from myself and from all these young people vary. But then there are certain underlining things which have to do with their participation in policy making processes, their participation in, in the community level, whether it is under the government or in the global processes. And when I just take agriculture alone, when talking to a lot of uh, young people, whether it is traditional norms or it is government policies, they have issues 
having access to land. They have issues having access to funding or having access to anything that makes their work more convenient, makes their work more um, having an increased potential to success. And of course, we can acknowledge that there are a lot of uh, sessions like this where young people get the opportunity to come in. But then for conferences, symposiums and other things that might span five days, one week, you would see that only two or three sessions, that's maximum, goes to these young people. If they are not traditionally or um, originally part, as, as, uh, I can hear them. if they are not recognized as a confident and reliable stakeholder in these discussions, at the end of the day, whatever happens would definitely not be a uniform benefit. The other thing is also the, the approach. A lot, of, a lot of young people also have quite not a pleasant experience regarding the approach with which we discuss matters at global uh, um, adaptation meetings at which we discuss matters with community-based adaptation planning or even at the adaptation, national adaptation planning at country levels. And much of this has to do with the isolation and as exclusion that uh, some of the people already noted on the jam board. A lot of young people have experienced having to participate in parallel sessions of certain crucial discussions. Now you participate in this parallel session, no matter the energy that these young people bring, at the end of the day, they are not at the main session that actually takes the final decision. So to what extent do they have their views reflected? To what extent do they have their, their aspirations balanced? When you organize these isolated sessions and parallel sessions, and then it is just, uh, it becomes an, um, a situation where their names are being mentioned, but in reality, their views and vision is not being pursued. So that, that, is, that is one key thing. The other, the other uh, key experience that some young people also have uh, encountered is the, the, the fact that there is such a distance, whether it is in the field of research or it is in practice, there's such a distance between the male, the female, as well as the young and the old. So we do not have integrated uh, activities whereby you see young people having the same opportunity to directly participate and produce knowledge for communities to, to, to use. It is a disjointed process. And when it is disjointed, it does happen that young people who are traditionally handicapped because they have they are yet to grow, they have therefore lesser experience, they have therefore less financial capacity, and they have little to no links or um, uh, contacts that they can, they can take certain information or make certain inputs. They become the people who are at the losing end because these uh, approaches that you are very much on your own does not help them. It does not give them the, 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 the grounds that they can have the ability to contribute effectively to adaptation efforts. There are a lot of, a lot of uh, other things concerning how much of support these people actually get if they are mobilizing communities, if they are trying to, to bring out certain discussions and trying to influence policy at the end of the day, how much of it actually work. But then considering that we have the opportunity to actually discuss in general um, and also break into groups, I wouldn't talk much more about the problems concerning how these young people are being marginalized and how these young people are continuously um, suppressed at, the, at their local levels. But then I would rather uh, make it short so that we get the opportunity to discuss what do we do going forward. We have, uh, those I have spoken to and in Tracy in my introduction also uh, mentioned 
what we do at Green Africa Youth Organization in Ghana in, in line of mobilizing these young uh, people, uh, supporting local communities, helping them to start initiatives that are helping them to mm -hmm. actually adapt and among other uh, um, young people across the world. Initiatives like this, how do we make it more realistic in the, the rather than the rhetoric? How do we make sure that every process that is towards community-based adaptation does not recognize young people as people we need to recognize, but rather as key stakeholders that are capable of providing solutions that anybody else could also provide. So I will end my, 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 <clears throat> my um, talk here, and then I hope that we, we go forward and have reliable solutions and we hope that at the end, uh, the main stakeholders, and I feel bad to, to always say this and, and not to put myself as a young person in the, in, the, in the category, but then my belief and my hope is that at the end of the day, the people in charge would allow women and youth to climb the ladder to that level to the extent that whatever they, their wishes are, are able to be reflected. Thank you. Thank you very much, Desmond, for that reflection. And uh, it keeps coming out again how we don't take young people seriously. And yet we know that uh, they, they dominate the highest population across the globe. So thank you so much for that. And our next speaker is, will be Rosemary Atieno. Uh, Rosemary serves as the project lead in Kenya for Women Climate Centers International who we are co-hosting this session with, and a consortium of women-led organization working in Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, South Africa, and USA. She's a member of the Global Women's Water Initiative and founder of the Community Mobilization for Positive Empowerment. With over 15 years of experience working with NGOs and public sector, including Kenya Ministry of Agriculture, K International in Kenya, K Kenya Meteorology, agency and concern worldwide. She has lots of experiences, uh, including on agriculture technologies, water conservation, environment. And in 2015, she was dubbed Women Making Change Kenya Water Initiative, and she an award-winning series that she was part of. So Rosemary, with all the experiences that you have and in the technology has been a theme across CBA over the years. And what comes out is that uh, technologies need to be people-centered, women need to be at the center, informing policies and planning. Young people need to be drivers of technology. We need gender analysis in technologies. But these are conversations that are going on and on, but exclusion has not stopped. So from your experience, how can in innovation address gender-based exclusion? and facilitate effective engagement of women in community-based adaptation. Over to you, Rosemary. Uh, Rosemary, you're on mute. Oh. I'm trying to unmute her, just one second. I don't have the chat. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I've unmuted. Oh, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, can you can, me? Rosemary. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome, uh, fellow panelists. Thank you, participants, for wanting to attend our session. I'm happy that uh, we are talking about uh, women and uh, innovation. And I would like to say that um, any society that fails to harness the energy of women is at a huge disadvantage in the modern world. Because women are key players in the climate change adaptation and mitigation issues. We are affected much by climate change, yet we are the least contributors to climate change. So I would want to say that uh, it is important that uh, we look at women as key players in our climate change issues and uh, try to bring them on board. Mm -hmm. As my colleague has said, the women and youth are actually disadvantaged in all sectors. We are disadvantaged in terms of uh, knowledge sharing, 
in terms of finances and in terms of gender roles that are socially constructed by the society. So when you look at uh, women's involvement in innovation, we are usually left behind because people think that we are not supposed to be there. It is important that uh, communities realize that uh, we cannot be avoided in the fight in climate change and we have to be brought on board. What we are trying to say is that uh, there is no shortage in innovations. There's a lot of innovation. But the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we use these innovations to help the women to move forward in the climate, in the fight about climate change and uh, creating locally led adaptations. Uh, through incorporating gender transformation activities, we need to look at strategies at all levels from the conception of projects to implementation through to monitoring and evaluation and see how we can bring women on board to be able to try and encourage critical awareness among them on their gender roles and uh, promote, the, promote the participation of women despite the various challenges that we are facing. I would want to say that uh, as we walk along this talk and as we walk along this path, can we look at ways of involving women? For example, a rural woman in the, in the village, I want to give a very critical example, the cook stove. We are the women using the, the cook stoves in the, in the rural kitchen where all the smoke is being inhaled by the woman and her little child on her back. All this is because of the gender constructed roles because the woman is supposed to be in the kitchen. At the end of the day, it's the woman suffering the consequences because death occurs and women die in their large numbers because of the gender constructed role. The man does not go to the kitchen. So we want to look at a situation on how can we bring women on the table? How can we bring women on the steering wheel where policies are being made that can be uh, fit for the women, women can contribute towards those policies that are being made that makes it very conducive for them to be able to access finances in order to act in the climate change mitigation roles. Are we looking at women and what they have to say in what happens? We do not want to be left behind because someone thinks that we are a lesser being. We are not lesser beings. We have a lot to contribute in the fight around climate change. Uh, I also want to say that uh, if you look at uh, the way innovation should be used, we should be looking at innovation, recognizing the vulnerabilities that uh, affect women and build strategies to target these women in their homes and villages. I also want to say that uh, we need to talk a lot about attitude. The people who are sitting on the steering wheel, what kind of attitude do they have on us as girls, women or boys? so that they, they must have a positive attitude towards us to be able to, to help us get on that steering wheel. We also need to build strategies that aim to empower vulnerable women through community conversations and mentorship programs where we have an active conversation going on and we have women contributing towards these uh, conversations and contributing towards the policies that are being made. I would like us to look at the issues of policies. Can we promote policies that are specific to gender and uh, allow women to participate in such activities. Uh, we also need to look at easy channels for women to access resources so that they're able to access the various technologies that are existing. For example, the mobile phone is a very common technology. Can all our women be able to access the mobile phone with simple language, simple to interpret messages? When you look at some of these messages, they are really meant for the, for the people who have gone to school. Let us look at the woman who has not gone to school and give her the technology with messages that she can understand, for example, in the local dialect. So that when I'm talking about adaptation, I'm able to talk about adaptation in the local dialect and be able to bring the woman on board my conversation about climate change. And uh, I want to say that this is why at WCCI, at the Women Climate Centers International, we are trying to have a conversation with the grassroots woman to understand what she really understands by climate change. Climate change adaptation, those are big words. Can we demystify these words so that we are able to bring the woman on board about this discussion? Can we be able to uh, 
look at technologies that are really friendly to the grassroots woman so that she's able to participate in this conversation. It really hurts me a lot when uh, the woman's voice is not being heard, yet she's the one suffering. We talk a lot with the grassroots communities, yet these voices, by the time it reaches the policy makers, the voices has been distorted to the level that the woman's voice is not being heard. So I'm saying that uh, we need to create a center stage for women to discuss. We have to create a center stage for women to have the discussion going on. For example, at the CBA 40, 15 now, was it possible for us to bring some grassroots women to voice their, 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 their voices and be heard so that we feel what they feel when it comes to climate change? So we need to really look at these things in a critical way to be able to involve our women in terms of knowledge, in terms of financial muscle, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the gender roles as constructed by society so that we, talk, we have a talk where everybody's involved for the benefit of the woman. So I hope that as the discussion continues, we will be able to come up with key points that will be able to help us to see how we involve the grassroots woman in terms of innovation and how to create proper leadership at the grassroots level. And for this, I want to say that uh, it was once said that when you want uh, anything said, Uh, you you went on mute, Rosemary. Rosemary muted herself there. Yeah, our experiences will be able to capture what our communities are saying. Sorry for there's a call that just came in. So uh, I hope that as we go to our group discussions, we will be able to have interactive that bring the voice of the woman on board and be able to take it to the next level. Thank you very much, Tracy. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for those very insightful. Thank you so much, Rosemary, for those very insightful. And please mute yourself. I'm getting noisy. And please mute yourself. I'm getting noisy. Yeah, thank you. So thanks, Rosemary, for those interventions. Rosemary raises very key issues of intersectionality, as we see it. Uh, interventions that are focusing on educated, the educated women, those that are not, how do we package information for different groups of people? Who do we bring on the table? How do we prioritize them? And that links to a chat conversation from Tracy Mann. Uh, most of the time we define technology as internet, SMS and connectivity, but then we ignore the technologies that facilitate the roles of different groups to ease how they cope with adaptation. Thanks, Tracy, for clarifying on that. And talking about issues of internet, one of our panelists is actually struggling with internet. I hope she'll be able to join. But these are challenges that we work with the digital divide between uh, the developing countries and others, the policies and all are all things that really still are affecting us in the way we do our interventions. So our next speaker is uh, Vitumbiko Chikono. He's a Pan-Africanist development worker with over 15 years experience in implementing climate adaptation and mitigation at national, regional, and global levels. He has worked with Care USA on learning and policy influencing on nutrition, climate, agriculture, investment, he has coordinated global climate change policy influencing work with ACT Alliance in Geneva, Switzerland, and his efforts focused on advocating for a proper and gender sensitive outcome for COP21 in Paris. And then currently he is working with the Pan-African Advocacy Project, African Agricultural Technology Foundation, and specifically on the Open Forum for Agricultural Biotechnology. So Vitumbiko, uh, the integrated approaches to adaptation, especially nature-based solutions is something that is being talked about a lot. And uh, it addresses key interlinked societal challenges, especially uh, local food systems. Climate change impact on food security is one of the key challenges uh, facing different parts of the world. And we know that indigenous people, women, local communities are already championing nature-based solutions. They hold valuable traditional knowledge that could be used. And this is built on decades of practical experience. 
but most times it's not recognized, it's not valued. We uh, respect a lot uh, scientific knowledge, but when somebody has something to share, we don't listen because sometimes we feel maybe it's not important and yet those solutions work and have worked for centuries. So from your vast experience at different scales, how can gendered and interse intersectional local knowledge and actions that are already happening contribute to resilient local food systems and contribute to ecosystem restoration? Uh, thank you very much, Tracy, and uh, also to my panelists, uh, <clears throat> but also to all those that are attending this session. Uh, I'm quite excited to be on this panel, and uh, I'm looking forward even to uh, a deeper conversation after my interventions during the breakaway groups. Uh, just to really uh, pick up from where you've started, Tracy, that it's unfortunate that he uh, sometimes we really just focus on science uh, and uh, completely sometimes neglect local knowledge and uh, uh, the local dynamics that do inform uh, most of uh, our interventions, uh, but also sometimes uh, exacerbate some of the vulnerabilities that we uh, uh, would be working on. Uh, so in terms of uh, to speaking to specifically to your question, uh, I think I would want to uh, uh, record two or three examples uh, of work uh, that really spoke to, um, I tried to uh, uh, pick on the uh, local knowledge and build on those local knowledge uh, towards something that has over time increased the resilience of, of communities where I worked uh, previously. Uh, I want to pick an example on the, um, uh, the care example on, full, uh, on the, uh, village savings and loans. Uh, this is uh, a technology that he probably was not famed at first, uh, but it was actually brought forward from Guinea and the people thought about how can we increase or build the resilience of our communities, uh, women and all that uh, who are affected disproportionately from the impacts of climate change. And that technology has actually grown. And by and large, all the reviews that have happened uh, have shown that, that women have been the biggest beneficiary of that technology. And I know that you work with care, so you also uh, bear witness to, uh, to what I'm talking about. But it is a technology that uh, when you read how it began, it faced a lot of resistance because this was in contrast to the uh, formal banking systems that we know. Uh, it couldn't work. These are women that don't know anything. How are they going to account for their shares and everything else? But I think over time, we've seen how it has actually become a very good solution uh, to uh, climate adaptation challenges that these women face. And by and large, we've also seen how, for example, the proceeds from village savings and loans have enabled the whole household in, in many cases to move away from uh, destructive natural resource explo uh, exploitation, for example, charcoal making. Uh, so communities or households that have embraced through a woman, uh, village savings and loans have actually moved away from charcoal making and embraced uh, other uh, entrepreneurship uh, uh, activities at household level that have enabled uh, natural resources to thrive in that setup. Another example that I want to give is also how, for example, uh, during the El Nino uh, scenario in Mozambique, uh, we noted how uh, women were disproportionately affected. And along the way, we also noted how uh, especially girls uh, were actually adopting very uh, uh, destructive practices. Uh, most of them went into sex trade uh, after um, even those that were uh, just newly married after their main uh, trade to Maputo. Uh, the only thing they could do is really go into, into, into sex trade. And we saw how uh, uh, this actually affected their communities in terms of HIV uh, prevalence, uh, how this also uh, uh, affected or maybe increased population growth in those setups. Uh, and in the end, uh, we also found out that HIV rates went up. And all those kind of things really taught us some lessons that probably when it comes to engaging in the climate change adaptation, 
uh, there isn't just one way out, but probably to really look at the, um, uh, the wholesomeness of a society and look at all issues that are affecting the society and bringing out uh, an integrative programming that addresses the specific needs of uh, different groups uh, uh, in that society. So with CARE again, we adopted a very integrative programming in those communities where I worked and in the end, I think we found that the, the resilience of these communities, as children went, started going back to school, those that got pregnant were able to be rehabilitated into, uh, into the communities, into the schools again. And those are the things that, for example, in the end of the day, because when we're talking about resilience, we're not just looking at one aspect. We want the whole community to thrive. Uh, and therefore, uh, if we just see one aspect doing well and the others really crumbling, then we need to be questioning our development model, whether we are achieving or not. Uh, I think this is also what has also enabled, for example, uh, the emergence of, of uh, uh, cash and markets as one of the disaster risk management um, uh, practices. Because uh, I think before that, we always looked at cash as something that we, we're just giving out money. But we've noted that, for example, if we want to address the food systems issues, we need to look at the fact that uh, some of the nutritional challenges in the communities are not just going to be addressed through production. So how, would, how do we want to bring in, for example, uh, nutritional uh, uh, elements in the community where they cannot produce? So by and large, what I'm trying to say is that I think to, to a greater extent, it does lead to better programming, does lead to better uh, adaptation, uh, and we are able to save communities uh, 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 wholesomely or holistically as, as, as it were. Uh, I also, I think Rosemary, my former, uh, my, my, uh, my, my fellow panelist, uh, well articulated uh, the point around uh, participation. I think participation is very important. Uh, and I had put I have put that point down in terms of how do we want to bring in women in uh into our policy and influencing spaces? Uh, and sometimes I think our engagement at that level is uh reduced to how many women, how many men uh, uh did attend the meeting. And in the end of the day, uh you find that indeed uh the our choices of who should attend our meetings is also informed by whether they're going to be able to uh, uh, engage in that meeting because we don't find value in somebody who is not going to engage in that meeting. But really just to reiterate what, uh, what Rosemary said, it is very important that we bring in women and engage at that level. And uh, I had an experience of that with, while working again with CARE where I brought a woman from the rural areas of, 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 uh, of Ethiopia to engage with policymakers at AU level on Malabo, uh, um, um, on Malabo processes. Uh, the point being that indeed women are different levels in as much as you, Trace and others on this call can uh, represent women, but I'm very sure that you not represent a woman who is affected disproportionately by climate change at the same level as she would represent herself. I took that challenge while working with CARE and she was able to uh, engage in that meeting in her local language and somebody had to translate to the policymakers who were, that were in that room. So just to emphasize that that is extremely uh, uh, important point that my colleague um, uh, Rosemary made. Uh, thirdly, I want to also talk about, again, uh, when you look at different societies that are affected by climate change, uh, we see, for example, uh, 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 societies and uh, cultural practices that uh, we can actually leverage on. And I know, uh, for example, in my own country, Malawi, where I come from, uh, we've seen societies where women uh, do make a very strong um, uh, decisions, for example, in electing the next leader. There's those kind of communities. Uh, and if women are disproportionately affected by climate change, and we know on one hand that he, Yes, they're affected, but they have this agency in them. How do we want to leverage on that in helping them elect leaders that are going to help uh, really restore uh, uh, ecosystems, uh, build resilience, but more importantly, be progressive in every aspect of their life. So that again is something that we need to explore. What are, what are the situations in the local setup that we're working on and how do we want to leverage on those? There's quite a lot that, for example, can, we can uh, uh, do in that sense, uh, not just on natural resources management, but basically even to impact on, the, uh, on governance. Uh, my last point basically is, again, uh, this kind of work around uh, gendered intersectionality and, and all that 
does demand that we do a very deep analysis to really arrive at what is the situation obtaining in a particular locality where we're intervening. Uh, and, and it does seem to me that it is actually something that will require a lot of investment. And my call on this one is probably the fact that I haven't seen a lot of movement uh, on the uh, development partners to provide resources that would enable uh, such level of deep analysis. So when you look at the call for proposals, uh, that aspect, for example, for deep intersectional analysis and how that, for example, should form uh, uh, programming, is not well articulated. In the end, I think those of us that are implementing on the ground, uh, we do not have any other option than to, pre to implement based on what we have actually been given. And sometimes with all the fact that uh, these proposals are time bound and everything, uh, then we really don't have enough time to be extremely intersectional and engendered so that we can bring out all these differences on the floor and also integrate them into uh, into, in, into our programming as it were. Uh, but by and large, I would say that I think if we had that at investment level, then I think it would go a long way to support uh, this holistic engagement and, 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 and programming uh, that we're doing on the ground and help to restore ecosystems and improve resilience uh, at large. So I would want to stop there and really to hope that we can have a deeper uh, engagement during the uh, breakaway sessions. And once again, to reiterate that I'm really uh, pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vitumbiko. You raised very important issues, meaningful participation, meaningful engagement, the agency of women and how they relate with other things, including policy. So we'll hear from other speakers on those. And uh, those who have questions, please uh, drop them in the chat. Uh, some of them you'll ask when we go for the breakout sessions. And we'll try and see if maybe the panelists could respond to some of those if we have time. Uh, thank you very much, Vitumbiko. That was really, really uh, interesting to hear your perspectives of, and your experiences. Our next speaker is Taylor Gama. Uh, she's been struggling with internet connection, just as we had. Uh, so Stella is an LDC negotiator and at the UNFCC and Deputy Director of Forestry at Malawi's Ministry of Natural Resources, Energy and Environment. She's been in the forestry sector for over 20 years. She's very passionate for enhancing women's effective participation in climate and environment diplomacy. She's been working at uh, climate diplomacy at the UNFCC, advocating for women's empowerment, gender balance in the Rio Convention bodies, gender responsive climate policies, technology development transfer. And she's also been an advisor on the list of opt countries initiative for adaptation and resilience. Um, I'm getting a message that uh, Stella has dropped off. Is she here? Stella, are you still here? I might be- She's back on now. Oh, she's back, great. So good to have you, Stella. So from, that very rich profile and experience. And Stella was recognized by a political early in March as one of the most influential people on gender policy or on climate. So Stella, we've been having lots of conversations around policy in CBA. And the key messages coming out have been that government needs to create gender transformative spaces where women can make their voices heard. And we are not looking only at women, but other groups that might be vulnerable, that might be impacted differently. And also uh, the emphasis that adaptation must be enabled through inclusive policies at country level, which is country driven using a whole of society approach. So from your experience, how are climate policies addressing or not addressing maybe gendered local needs and priorities? Oh, thank you very much, Tracy, and mm. greetings to all uh, participants. My uh, apologies, I think I had not updated my calendar to 15th. I had still kept the 17th uh, date. Mm -hmm. So we are traveling, we are outside the longer. So I just stopped to briefly to take uh, this um, um, presentation. Thank you, Stella. Uh, 
Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, let, allow me to start from where we come from under the Climate Change Convention. Under the Climate Change Convention, we now have the Gender Action Plan. And the Gender Action Plan has been influenced uh, at the negotiations. It's a long history. First of all, we started with uh, decisions which were looking at gender balance in the UNFCCC process. But later on, we said we should move beyond just the gender balance. We should also look at women empowerment and effective participation, not just uh, numbers of women, but the women who are participating should be effectively empowered to participate in decision making. And then we also said, no, we need to go beyond gender balance or women participation, but we also need to look at the policies themselves. So we started now looking at gender responsive policies so that all the policies that are coming out from the uh, climate conventions should uh, be gender responsive. And it's not only the climate convention, under the uh, uh, Rio conventions, we have the UNCCD, we have the CBD, they are also looking at gender responsiveness. But now we have the gender responsive policies at global level. For example, we could talk about the NAPS and uh, recently the NDCs we should also be able to link this gender responsiveness, which is happening at global level and link it to national level. And we should go beyond that. When the national level has linked the gender uh, uh, responsive policies, we should also make sure that this is reflected adequately at local and village levels. So how do we do that? An example is, for example, at national level, when at national level, at, at global level, we have the national policy, the global policies, which have filtered to comprehensive, probably policies at national level. For example, in Malawi, we have a, a national gender policy, but the sectors are also looking gender responsive policies, for example, climate change, forestry, and also environmental management in general. But we should be able to go further than that, just having gender uh, responsive policies. We need action. And one proposed action from, from policy to action level is that the policies that we are developing should have at least a gender um, action plan or within the implementation plan, we should have specific engendered actions that will show that the policies are really uh, showing impact on the ground. And from the national level, how are we feeding to local level? For example, Malawi, we are saying that at local level, we are decentralized. And are those decentralized policies also gender responsive? If we look at the community activities, do they show that the policies they are implementing are gender responsive? For example, um, if you look at waste management, waste management, I look at it as an area where we have not really engendered that uh, process. The energy case, as I've seen in, in the uh, text, um, in the chat, energy security, it is an issue because we do not have gender, local level gender action plans. No one is looking at the gender security at village level or at local level. Maybe sometimes we're just looking at energy security as um, provision of um, uh, the grid, 
But if you look at least developed countries like Malawi, we are still dependent on biomass. And biomass, it is a women's, it is a girl's issue. As such, no one wants to uh, bring the issues of biomass at uh, policy or strategic level because it is only about women in the village who are going to collect firewood or who are going to use uh, charcoal. And another example also in disasters. In disasters, we might think that it is, we have uh, uh, gender mainstreamed, but sometimes it is not. During disasters, for example, in Malawi, when we have floods, men would want to relocate to areas where they can get jobs and support the families in, in the areas where there was a disaster. So it is both the needs of men and women, boys and girls in different situations, in different roles and in different needs. So what is it that we need? First of all, I've talked about the two of coming up with uh, gender action plans that is beyond policy to have activities that can be implemented and also activities which can be monitored. So the implementation plan will also require that we have uh, a monitoring and evaluation plan. Another important tool is to conduct gender analysis as we are programming before conducting the interventions. In that case, as it has already been highlighted, we will look at the different situations. It's on a case by case basis, which will be based on regions, districts, um, different cultures, different religious beliefs will present different situations, different interests. So we need to take all that into consideration. Uh, for now, yeah. allow me <clears throat> to talk from there that uh, at global level, we have these uh, global policies whom we have uh, struggled to ensure that they have, uh, uh, they are gender responsive. Mm. The, the, the work is still uh, ongoing. At national level, we have embraced that uh, discourse that we also need to have gender responsive policies, but is the action on the ground showing that. So I will mm. just say that we need these two tools at local level to ensure that the gender responsive policies are reflected in our day-to-day -day action, the gender analysis and also the gender action or gender implementation plans at local level. In that way, we will have everybody, all the population participating effectively and include in, uh, development without leaving anyone behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stella. Stella raises very key issues. It's not just about policies, but are we implementing them? And I think we know uh, most countries have so many policies that are on the shelves and not being implemented. She also raises the issue of how policies are made, who is targeted, what is targeted as well. So who is feeding into the policies? Are they fit for purpose? Are they considering issues of different groups in community and the experiences they are having around adaptation? So thank you so much, Stella. Uh, there were some interventions in the chat, observation that the NDC assessment noted that gender equality was not very well addressed. Uh, there's another one which is asking if the examples of impacts that have resulted from gender responsive language and policy. Uh, we'll look at some of these in the group discussions. Uh, the, we, we'll, we are picking the questions and we'll follow up with those. If there's time at the end, maybe the, panel, the panelists will speak to one or two, but please bring up most of them into the group discussions. So our last speaker, last but not least, uh, is uh, Mago. And uh, Mago Granat is the director for Engine Collaborative. 
She's a gender and climate specialist with over 10 years of international experience and experience and intergovernmental experience, delivering work on technical advice for inclusive and sustainable development results. She has worked across climate sectors on integrating gender responsive and social inclusive approaches, policies, financing, and on the ground action. She has also worked on uh, integrating gender and intersectionality in climate finance mechanisms at different levels. And her recent work has been on inclusive gender responsive climate change budgeting and financing in Africa, which is looking at how um, ministries of finance and other climate ministries are working on integrating gender into the budgeting process. So Margot, of course, climate is a very widely spoken subject, it's very contentious at the moment. And we know that there are structural barriers to funding. The climate architecture is generally oriented towards larger projects or initiatives, larger organizations who can demonstrate capacity to deliver versus the groups that we are looking at today, the women organizations, the youth organizations, indigenous people organizations, or global South CSOs uh, for that matter. The evidence shows that very little funding is trickling down to these organizations and because of those barriers that they're still struggling with. So from your wide experience, how, how is climate finance responsive or not responsive to gendered needs and priorities? that could enhance local adaptation from what we've heard on what is possible, what could be done. So, and climate is one of those catalysts for everything to happen. So over to you, Mago. Thanks, Tracy, and thanks everyone. It's great to be here with you all today and following on all these great interventions from other panelists. I'm just motivated and excited to hear everything that people are working on. And it is fitting to speak um, following all these pieces as financing is sometimes the, the glue to this as it is always demonstrated as the gap. Um, we hear time and time again that there just isn't enough financing um, at all levels from international, multilateral to local grassroots level, like you were saying, Tracy. Um, and like Stella was just saying, translating from the policy level down to the national and action on the ground, it's just not happening. And, and we know this and the scale that we know we need for financing the climate crisis and building resilience across all these communities is not available even at any level. And then exactly like down at the groups, how is it getting to these local level communities? We, we really see that it's not happening. It is exactly a trickle, even though it's often talked about in, in channels, uh, we're not seeing that um, larger, you know, wave of money making it anywhere into the in the communities that we need it to be in. Um, and so it is coming from so many different spaces and angles uh, that it's very difficult to track. Um, there's a lot of really great research out there right now on how challenging it is to track and so we can't show where the money is really coming from and what is really happening on the ground and what kind of results are um, being are, are impactful and because this complex web of financing has been created uh, you know there usually are the 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 usual suspects who are well equipped to access these funds and they receive it um, they understand the entry points and, and so the con we continue to see that these barriers for um, accessing financing for local communities, local organizations, they're just upheld. And so these are some of the, the challenges. Um, you know, I wanna provide a bit of context right now, and I'm gonna try to do that rather quickly uh, on how gender is being integrated at the different levels, um, realizing that I could probably speak for several sessions about this. Um, and also in the interest of time, but we can discuss this more in the, the sessions as well when we hear from all of you. So um, what is climate financing? Of, often uh, we really don't know. It is such a um, term that has evolved over the past decade or so. Um, I Googled it uh, just to make sure I had this definition correct. And the UNFCCC defines it as uh, finance that aims at reducing emissions and enhancing sinks of greenhouse gases and aims at reducing vulnerability of and maintaining and increasing the resilience of human and ecological systems to negative climate change impacts. 
And so that's fairly technical. Uh, it does include a human element, which is great because as Stella was just pointing out, integrating gender and human rights into the international policy space uh, that took a pretty long time. Um, but thankfully that now does exist. And it's, we're also seeing it in the financing mechanisms at the international levels, particularly for um, the UNFCCC, uh, the implementing entities, which are the Green Climate Fund, the Global Environmental Facility, the GEF, uh, the Green Climate Fund, the GCF, and also the Adaptation Fund. Those three are the large multilateral public finance mechanisms. Um, and also Stella spoke about the Lima Work Program on Gender, which does include gender responsive um, climate financing and gender responsive budgeting that is encouraging uh, national governments to also take that up. Um, and so each of these funds, these finance mechanisms now do also integrate gender within them. They all have gender policies. Um, a lot of them also have, uh, you know, social inclusion or indigenous policy as well. So starting to go beyond just a gender, but have that much more intersectional um, approach to how they're looking at things. And they also usually have a gender action plan and, and a gender and social inclusion plan. Um, and these include different elements such as operations for the secretariat of the funds, um, building capacity, knowledge sharing. Uh, you know, these are specific elements that are important around gender because there needs to be a lot of capacity building, yes, for women in local communities on the ground on what climate change is, but exactly to one of the questions of, you know, how do we engage men? Men also need to be a part of this. They need to know what it, it means to have a gender responsive, a gender transformative approach. And so capacity building across all different levels for the national governments, you know, ministries of um, environment and climate change, forestry and waste, all of those, especially in spaces where it hasn't been traditionally seen to have, um, you know, the human dimension in, in incorporated into those activities. So that is a really important element that is included within those action plans. And of course, then a huge component of that is how gender is integrated into the projects by the cl climate finance mechanisms. And as people have mentioned, there's a gender assessment, a gender analysis. They can be not as robust as we would like to see them be. They, sometimes we see that organizations that are conducting them they're, they are time you know, bound, they have to be done quickly, they have to be done before the proposals are done. Um, it's hard to really you know, have a strong intersectional analysis that then also plays into what is the gender action plan and how that also is integrated into the larger project. And the huge component of that is also how you budget then for those activities within that project. And there are mandates within each of the finance mechanisms now that need to in integrate gender, but it is more of a you should you need to do this rather than a you know a specific benchmark of how much. Um, having conversations with those uh, implementing entities from the funds about how they actually budget for those different activities is something that's starting to be picked up a lot more. Um, it's coming out in the results frameworks. Uh, it's realized much more so now that you know to achieve any of these climate goals, we also need to be working and integrating a gender responsive and intersectional approach. Um, so that's a very cursory view of the international level. Um, there is also so much more climate financing. Um, and again, because it's so challenging to track, but climate financing coming from philanthropy, coming from bilateral aid, uh, donors, um, development organizations also, um, and, and then the intermediaries that get the financing from the international mechanisms and also coming into the national level there. And something that I think is really important that Tracy mentioned work I've been doing recently is looking at how to integrate gender responsive budgeting at the national level with the ministries of finance and a double mainstreaming, so to say, of climate change and gender at the same time. Um, you know, countries are realizing uh, and, and working very much so towards if this money is going to be channeled down towards their um, the, the national level, how to bring it into the public financial management system. And when we're doing that by integrating uh, the climate, um, you know, with different markers and doing assessments of how climate is being incorporated in the budget, looking at budget statements, we also need to make sure that those statements are also playing in and integrating gender and, and intersectional dynamics um, to make sure that the budget is providing resources to the very communities that we need to be supporting. And, and that's actually a really good entry point, I think, for local communities to be able to access resources is to advocate and provide the research that shows that this is um, 
influential for those communities. Uh, and a lot of those um, tools have already been mentioned actually by other panelists today, which I think is really great, um, such as like cash transfer programming, um, different mechanisms to provide uh, innovative tools and technology, um, getting the different women's rights groups involved, um, you know, how to build their resilience more structurally as a comprehensive mechanism in those communities rather than just addressing some and, and responding to perhaps a, a climate change issue or impact. Um, at the local level, something I think that is also really important to touch on is getting women's participation, youth participation, um, marginalized groups participation to build their capacity about what exists for climate financing, break down this web of um, where it comes from, what's happening. Um, IAED is also doing some work right now on getting that information to grassroots organizations by mapping climate funders. Uh, there's a whole heap of them out there. And I also think, um, you know, there's a, there's a new kind of angle, if anyone's heard of Project Drawdown, um, they're, they're realizing that to support and, and make sure that we address the climate crisis, there need to be structural changes around uh, public health and also education. And those are things that maybe have not necessarily been historically thought of as climate um, work, but that is going to be integral and the role that women and girls play in those two different places to increase their access to education and sexual and reproductive health rights and, and, and general health resources, those can now become climate financing. So looking for that financing through different funders that maybe haven't tagged their financing as climate funding, funding, I think is also a really good opportunity just to be able to know and build your capacity about what exists and, and what can be um, done. Uh, there's a couple of um, you know, tools that can be accessed and I can share more about them um, in, the, in the breakout group, but really like nitty gritty details about how to get involved, learning about the different climate finance mechanisms. The international mechanisms are still where we are trying to, you know, make it the most sound institution and, and channeling for financing so that that can get down to national level and it can get down to community levels. So learning about those and learning how you can engage um, through either uh, civil society um, groups that advocate and participate in the board meetings that review all the different project documents. Um, also, I think, you know, for don donors and funders that are maybe on this, um, it's particularly, I think I saw someone from both ends, both ends has done a lot of support to um, make sure that those local level women's rights groups will be able to actually participate in those sessions because it takes a lot of time and effort and again, resources to be able to um, participate in that. So I'll stop there uh, since I know we're running behind. <laughs> yeah. And go ahead. Thanks, Margo. Thanks very much for that. Uh, a lot of information in there. The learning is not only for organization, but also for donors uh, to uh, restructure where they put the money, who they fund. Uh, and also, it's not only the donors, even governments actually prioritizing different groups at country level, including funding into the budgeting systems. So it needs action across different scales. Uh, thanks for that. And more information can be shared in the group. Margo will be facilitating the group on finance. So if you have any questions or discussions, please raise them. So uh, thank you all panelists for your very insightful contributions. Let's continue the discussion. I want to hand over to Karen right now to take us to the breakout groups to brainstorm a bit more on what needs to happen. We don't want to lament on problems all the time. We want to be solution focused. And that's what the groups are going to do. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Tracy. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, thanks to all our panelists for such important points that opened mm -hmm. the door very neatly to our group discussions. Um, and thanks for everyone who have contributed as well in, in the chat box. Um, there are some topics that tend to be overlooked, but uh, Melvin, uh, Van Der Veen, and Gabriela Mercurio highlight um, the aspect of um, bringing attention to the need to, to think about the role of men and uh, brings attention that the gender, unequal gender dynamics respond and are shaped also by, by men's roles and activity and um, masculinity that, that this highlights the need to rethink 
masculinity and gender roles um, and how to um, deconstruct these this patriarchal systems by examining the ways in which men can uh, shift the ways in which masculinities are created. So thanks for everyone who have highlighted uh, different points that are that are uh, that need to be addressed. Um, mm -hmm. There are some additional very important comments in in the in the chat box. So bring your perspectives into your breakout groups. We will have five breakout groups. Um, Nora, could you share the questions, please? We will have five questions group uh, breakout groups. Um, and one, one, one question that your group will, will address. We will have 20 minutes. Um, you will be allocated randomly to, to these discussions. Um, if you have a strong preference to join one, one group, um, you can do so. Um, we wanted to, to be allocated randomly so you can share and even share even if you are not um, engaged in that conversation, but maybe we can, we can um, um, had the benefits of going up, uh, uh, differently to our uh, our comfort zone. But if you have a strong preference to join um, a different group, uh, please do so. And at the end of the discussions, we will, we will have time to, um, to bring two central core messages from your discussion. Uh, so be prepared to highlight and choose among yourselves who will um, feedback. And Nora, have you said? everyone you will be invited yeah, shortly just to one join second i have to stop so screen sharing you just have to click join and we will see each other in 20 minutes so um, welcome back uh from the groups i know it's never the time is never enough i know some of you were cut in between the discussions but as we mentioned we are going to post the report of this session on slack we have also used Jamboard to take notes. We'll also put the Jamboard on Slack. So if you have other ideas to add in or get in touch with other people, please go ahead. So at this moment, I want to hand over to my namesake, Tracy Mann, to listen to the feedback and close off the session. Tracy, thank you so much. I'm always honored to share this name with such a distinguished scholar, activist, and, and, and passionate, passionate practitioner as yourself. It's really an honor and a pleasure. And thank you all who participated today. And uh, we're very interested to hear some of the top messages that have come out of your discussions. I'm just going to go um, by the list of breakout groups and uh, that I have here on my sheet. And so I will start, Margot, with you to give us a couple of messages from the Climate Finance Group, please. Sure, thanks, Tracy's. Um, uh, so we had kind of a conversation with some questions and did share some experiences, which I thought were really interesting. Um, I think the two things that I wanna share is how important a holistic approach to climate change and resilience is, and especially in thinking about financing. Um, we talked about, you know, it can't just be specific climate change activities, but you know, looking at the breadth of what um, development and support can be, especially for local communities, um, how to get financing into their hands. So, so not just maybe the usual suspects and the, and the usual mechanisms. Um, and the other point that I thought was really interesting, we talked a bit about um, doing financial training and financial literacy and how to build the skills that that can be a really important component for climate financing all the way down to that really local level, that community level, household, individual level for them to be able to build their business skills and engage. Um, and particularly also there was a point tagged on to that, which I think is really interesting to share as well from Tracy was how important when we start to increase financing down to the local level and when that is existing, that, you know, yes, we're going to provide this financial training and that is absolutely critical so that there's transparency and understanding about where this money is and where it's going. Um, but also that there are professionals that, you know, do this um, who are accountants and they can also be hired. And if that's included within local level um, financial support to actually be able to engage them, how, you know, revolutionary that could be to, you know, have them actually provide that service then to the local community. So, you know, we all can be kind of like broad based knowledge around financing, but we don't need to be CPAs and account executives, et cetera, to, to make that happen. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Margot. Thank you. Um, next will be Rosemary. 
Rosemary, can um, can you report out on the innovation group? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Tracy. So the innovation group had a very nice discussion and uh, it is coming out very clearly that uh, as we look at innovation in promoting inclusive leadership, we must look at a few key things. One key thing that is really coming out that it is important for communities to have a platform for conversation because innovation is not just about technology, it is anything new that can be used to create new activities for local led adaptations. So it's important for conversations to be held so that we understand the situation that the various vulnerable and differently abled groups in the community are having so that we are able to integrate all the voices so that as we use technology to pass the information, then all the voices have been captured. Uh, the second point that really came out so well is that uh, when you have conversations with communities, you get very creative ideas for the future, especially from the youth. So you will be integrating the youth ideas, the indigenous knowledge and using technology to convey the same. So we should not really push everybody towards technology, but looking at the different groups, let them pick the kind of innovation that they want to move forward with. Then we have uh, come up that uh, during in innovations, there's a very important aspect of co-creation. Communities have knowledge, communities have ideas. So all we are doing is we are co-creating solutions with the communities. And if we co-create solutions with communities, then we have high chance of sustainability, high chance of replicability and achieving more in terms of uh, output and outcomes. Lastly, we are looking, we came up with a point on technology that after all ideas have come up from the very innovative ideas, we are able to use technology now to pass on the ideas that have been shared. For example, storytelling. We could get stories being told by grassroots communities and use our mobile phones to pass that story to make somebody know what is happening mm -hmm. or entice somebody. And then now uh, we need to look at innovation in terms of the new versus the already existing in relation to the context and outcome that we are looking at. So in short, we concluded that if we are to be innovative, then our innovations must have an aspect of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Our innovations must have an aspect of uh, providing a center stage for community discussions. Mm -hmm. And then we must have constructive dialogues and then we must promote strengthening of partnerships and networks for addressing climate change impacts as we come up with our innovations. Thank you, Tracy. Rosemary, thank you so much. And thank you too for, for defining technology in a, in a way that is rele relevant to local communities. I find we often discuss technology on the global north level of uh, internet connectivity mm -hmm. and this kind of thing. And you're really talking about what's meaningful mm -hmm. at the community level. So that, that's a very, uh, very valuable observations there. Now I'd like to go on please to the nature-based solutions group that was led uh, by Mr. Chicono. Uh, for our group, uh, thank you very much, Tracy. For our group, Melvin is reporting on our behalf. So Melvin, you have the floor. Thank you. All right, so I'll be brief. Um, the first uh, thing that came up quite quickly during the conversation is that uh, gender should be really integrated at the start of a project. Uh, make sure that you don't make it just a tick the box at the end of the project cycle. Uh, really think about it carefully. Um, and then at the end of the conversation, we touched upon something that I think would require another hour, um, it, it, which is really interesting because um, on the one hand, you want to promote local knowledge. Um, you want to build on local knowledge. On the other hand, um, you may have um, uh, an objective, a goal to ensure that gender equality is being promoted. Uh, and sometimes that, that can be a dilemma. Sometimes local knowledge can be hampering for achieving gender equality or well, how you understand gender equality. Um, so there was a response as well from uh, one of our attendants from uh, participants from Bangladesh who mentioned that for them, it's, it's really important that their work is uh, bottom up, that you start from the communities that you built on local knowledge and that sometimes, yeah, it, it may take time. Um, it may be a long road, 
um, but that will be much more sustainable if you really look into the needs and the wishes of communities and um, don't try to push, um, as I understand it, for um, all types of gender-related outputs, um, but really take your time and respect uh, the context that you're working in. Melvin, thank you so much. I think that was a great follow-up actually to Rosemary's remarks. There seem to be some synergies in terms of uh, the local uh, level as, as you described. Um, all right, let's go on to uh, uh, Desmond. Would you speak about your group and youth participation, please? Yeah, in, in my group, we, we focused much uh, on few issues so the first one is the need to understand youth as a group and the disparities that also exist within this youth group so looking at south north looking at the city and in the rural areas and looking at even uh, people with certain disabilities but are also uh, young people and then the other thing was how do you reach these people and get their their ideas to contribute to 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 the agenda so the the institution that want to engage these young people have to to tailor a message to these people whether it is going to be you uh, social media that you will use to to mobilize them or you would go to from community to community or house to house it depends on the youth particular category that you are looking at. And also the other thing was that you need to also tailor the message in a way that even though you would not engage every individual, whatever results you are getting, it's a, a reflection of all of them or the majority. The other thing is that the institutions usually tend to to, 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 to approach um, young people in a little of a biased manner because the, 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 the focus is more on, for example, a youth group that is more organized, a youth group that is more vocal, and that might not be effective. So one other thing to consider could be actually supporting that uh, uh, that uh, uh, sub providing support for such youth groups to to actually also organize, so that uh, then they become more uh, uh, reflective of what the institutions consider uh, relevant to to uh, to consult. Um, yeah, I think these were most of the things. There were also uh, other things regarding the the understanding level of these youth groups, whether whatever they are usually pursuing is the same. It's everybody within the group thinking the same way. And it's uh, uh, all of them having the capacity to also contribute. And that's places that institutions need to also take note and, uh, and, and, and provide whatever support is needed. I think we had more issues that we discussed and uh, my, my group members who were in this group, feel free to, to come in. Desmond, thank you so much. Uh, we're running a little bit over time, but I certainly think we uh, will want to hear please from the, uh, <clears throat> from the responsive policies group. And I'm not sure, is um, Estella able to lead us on that? Or is there another spokesperson from that group that would like to contribute? Um, thanks, Tracy. Stella was not able to join. Okay. So I'll just quickly share, knowing that we are over time, the two key things agreed. One of them is uh, addressing the disconnect between global policy and local implementation realities. We are hearing GCF and others have policies, but are they aligned with what is happening on the ground? Are they looking at uh, how they are being financed and others? And the second one was on doing things bottom up, locally led adaptation policies, because most of the policies are not fit for purpose because people are not included. It's the technocrats who do these policies without realities on the ground. So those are the two major ones we agreed, but we will share the rest of the information plus the report on Slack in case you're interested in following up and do continue with the conversation on gender equality and intersectionality. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Tracy. And I'd just like to close by, by reinforcing the messages that we've heard today from all of our groups. There was a theme of bottom-up community-based approaches. And to the degree that we take this out in our work this week, in our conversations, and our work throughout the year until we meet again in the CBA community, um, I, I encourage you to communicate through all the channels that CBA offers through IIED and many other partners are great resources and there are individuals who want to support you in this challenging and so necessary work. And I wish you all a very good day and evening. Thank you so much.